Hello friends and welcome to our series on Banyan Talks, Banyan Chats. Uh, today I am delighted and privileged to welcome Professor Barry Norton, who is a chaired professor, uh, the Sok Kwan Luk Professor uh, at University of San, uh, California at San Diego. Uh, you are part of the Graduate School of Global Policy and Strategy. Uh, he is one of, uh, I would consider, uh, the foremost experts uh, on China, uh, so a China watcher, shall we say. And uh, he's here at Gokhale Institute. We're delighted to have you here. Uh, this Banyan Chats is, is something we, you know, we want, we like uh, our guests to uh, give their views or talk about various things. But since you're a China uh, scholar, I want to begin by asking you that uh, the Chinese Communist Party uh, recently celebrated 100 years. It's a very long time. So, uh, the world is fascinated by China and, and it's a single party system, I don't know, uh, totalitarian dictatorship, I don't know, single party democracy, we don't know, but uh, what gives the legitimacy to the Chinese Communist Party? Well, I think two things. The first, you know, Mao Zedong, although we, we think of him a little bit cautiously because of some of the disasters he led China into later, but he did mobilize the Chinese people to expel the Japanese, expel the imperial power, and set up the People's Republic of China. I think that gave him, that gave him personally and the Communist Party enormous legitimacy. And then after 1978, well, the Chinese economy has grown faster, longer than any economy in the world. So, of course, the Communist Party gets a lot of the credit for that. And that certainly bolstered their legitimacy tremendously. So it's economic growth, uh, improvement in standard of living, and improvement uh, for the lives of the people. That's the source of their legitimacy, right? Uh, I think that's fair to say, absolutely. But the uh, people are not, uh, I mean, people from the West or people from outside China, they sometimes wonder if uh, uh, the kind of uh, suppression of basic freedoms uh, that uh, we suspect uh, are there in China. Does that not diminish the legitimacy of the party? I think it uh, constrains it a little bit. Uh, people are aware of it. Um, they, I think there's a kind of a, a suppressed feeling in China that we've made it and now we would just like to be free to live our lives the way we want to. We just like to be normal people, modern people. And so there is, uh, maybe starting to be some tension between the rulers and the people. Uh, of course, that's hard to say because we don't have any good opinion polls or anything. But I think from my sort of post-COVID visits to China, it's clear that there's a, a certain sense of dissatisfaction, which is relatively new. So we'll, uh, I want to ask you about that. But before that, I want to mention to you that the rise of China, as you said, from 1978, it's actually nothing short of a miracle in modern history the transformation of the lives of hundreds of millions of people. But the rise of China in the minds of especially Western economies and others uh, causes some disquiet or maybe uh, uh, some kind of anxiety or concern or maybe fear. Uh, it's somehow, somehow it's seen as, uh, it's, a, it's called a threat. Uh, and India and China are two large uh, countries in population and India is now the third or fourth largest economy. But India has also been growing fast, but the rise of India does not elicit the same kind of reaction. Do you sense that difference? And if the difference is there, what, what is, what, why so? Uh, I definitely sense the difference. It's certainly, certainly there. I think there's two reasons why China is especially seen as troubling. Uh, one is China was such an enormous beneficiary of globalization and the open system. So you'd think, you'd assume that a, a beneficiary country would have a bias towards supporting the rules and norms of that system. And yet China seems exactly the opposite. And so we wonder, well, why is that? What's, what, what motives drive that? The second thing is that China by itself can only really disrupt the global system if it has very tight uniform control over all its people. And that's necessarily threatening. Whereas when we look at India, we understand 
Well, there's, of course, there's lots we don't understand about India, but at least we understand it's a democracy. Yeah. It's driven by different forces and domestic interest groups, and therefore it's going to be complicated. It's not going to be a single unified force that pushes for one particular thing. So the democracy in India is the, is the differentiating factor. I think so. And, uh, you know, when you mentioned the Chinese have benefited from globalization, and uh, I'm reminded of that song. I don't know what's the what are the words. It says, "Is it Beatles or someone?" They said, "You have been stealing my love." <laughs> so the Chinese have been stealing your love. Uh, but you know, the, you mentioned that uh, now it's it's maybe there is trouble ahead for China because they have delivered high growth, a higher standard of living, but the process ahead it's not clear. So what is? Of course, you're, we're going to hear you in your talk uh, later today, but. What do you think is, uh, what are the sources of troubling uh, points for the Chinese? Well, I mean, the, the most important difficulties are that their growth potential is slowing, but the commitment that the government is making de facto to, to industrial policy, high technology, all those things is increasing. And that means there's increasingly sort of left, less left over. And I think for the next couple of years, it's not going to change because Xi Jinping is very committed to it. But after a couple of years, we'll start to see some of the results and we'll get a sense of how they'll square the circle. I think the, uh, it's very important to have a very uh, in-depth China scholarship. And I'm very happy you visited us. In fact, as you know, we are developing a center here. And uh, I do hope that you will continue to remain in, in contact and in some ways involved with uh, China scholarship from India. Uh, we have to wrap up now. So I thank you, Barry Norton, for being with us today. And I look forward to your talk later today. Thank you.